Number four. All right. The net worth game is the game everyone plays, whether they know it or not. Here, we pick up where traditional schooling failed at educating the truth about money. Think financial success seems to be a secret only if you know? Well, this show aims to demystify and deconstruct wealth accumulation. Not wealthy. Not successful yet. It's not your fault. The information isn't taught in school. Let's uncover the secrets to growing wealthier together. Now, here's your host, Josh Darville, with the Net Worth Game. All right. I have a very special guest today, uh, Steve Sims, author of the book Blue Fishing. Um, you're never going to believe what this guy has been able to pull off in his life and his business. Um, went from uh, what uh, uh, laying bricks to now making the extraordinary happen. Um, worked with Richard Branson, uh, Elon Musk, and many, many other people. Um, and he has a quote, and he says, there's a password for every door. Let's just dive right into it. Mr. Sims, welcome to the Net Worth Game. I'm super excited that you're here. Uh, book, Blue Fishing, very interesting stuff. <laughs> just go ahead and tell us a little bit about how you make the magic happen. Wow. So that's that's a big question to start with, isn't it? Um, look, it's cool to be here for a start, but I've got nothing of interest. Uh, I'm the exact same as everyone else maybe just more aggravated and more curious. You see, I've always been a curious kid why I didn't have money, why I didn't have this, why I wasn't there. Coupled that with the aggravation that I wanted it, that I actually went out and started trying to hang around with rich people because if a rich person had a yacht and I wanted a yacht, then who better to ask than someone who's got a yacht? Um, so that's what I did. I went from being a doorman to you know, pulling off these amazing experiences, not because I'm a social butterfly, not because I look like Brad Pitt and I love wearing a tuxedo, but because I wanted to make you happy so the following day or two I could have an hour-long conversation with you and quite simply pick your brains on how you're successful and I wasn't. Bottom line of it is I did this in the 80s and 90s. If I was starting that job today, I don't think I would. I'd do exactly what you're doing. I'd do a podcast because a podcast is a great excuse to be nosy on how other people do things. Right. Well, and one of the things in your book was, would you chug a beer with somebody? So I came prepared, sir. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I just, I, I think that it's very interesting how many different ways that we look at being creative, right? And yeah. um, Think and Grow Rich was a life-changing aha moment for me. It was like, how do you get, how do you get out of your own way? You know, abundance. And thinking about, like, what are we able to do for other people? And how is it that you're um, – I, I don't want to take up a ton of time rehashing stories in the book, but uh, you get into the essence of people and you figure out what is it that they really want. Give us some some questions that you do I mean, on these interviews. See, the how do sad you get thing is that's because of, that's because of our societal um, shift. You see, today we're terrified. Today we're shit scared. And you, you, you run a podcast. And you're always a little bit kind of like, oh, my God, I've got to be careful what I say. I can't drop the F-bomb. I can't, I can't say something that can be taken out of context. Everything we say can be taken out of context. Okay? It's just there are people out there waiting to play the gotcha game. Oh, he said something. That's, that's racially intense. Oh, my God, that's against women. Oh, my God, that's against short midgets, whatever, all right? But we've got into that world of gotcha. So in which case, we don't talk openly. We don't talk freely. You see, if you say to someone, hey, if you want a million dollars tomorrow, what would you do? You'll get a response like, oh, I'd get a hot tub with all the Hawaiian traffic women or, yeah, oh, I'd, I'd buy a jet and fly around the world. And you let them get it out of that system. And then you go, okay, that's great. What would you be doing with the money in six months? And they slow down a cog and they go, well, my school didn't have a good playing field. So I think I'd put a playing field in there because I never got to play football when I was a kid. And I think that may have changed. We all, you know, um, there's a home near me and it's a bit run down, but the people are really good. I'm going to do the house up just for them. You know, all of a sudden things change. 
So it's like dating. You never meet your girlfriend on the first date. You meet what she wants to portray. Okay. She acts a certain way. She doesn't fart at the table. She doesn't chug whiskeys back. She's all sweetness and light until a few dates in that you suddenly see the layers come off and you get to meet the person. When that's the same thing with my clients, my clients will go, yeah, I, I, um, uh, I want to do this. And I learned the most aggressive, almost violent word from a very young age that can stop someone in their tracks. It's not a four-letter word. It's actually better if it's a three-letter word. It's the word why. So I'd get people saying to me, oh, yeah, I want to I wanna do this without on John. I'd be like, oh, that's great. Why? And then just yeah. shut up. And it would knock them. And they'd be like, oh, um, uh, and the tempo changes, the cog changes, the speed changes. And you get to hear the real reason. So I wasn't a psychologist at school. I didn't study human behavior. I was a doorman of a nightclub. My job description was to punch people. But I actually found, like all entrepreneurs, when we're dealt a, uh, um, some cards or we're dealt a bad day or whatever, we focus on how can we make this a win for us rather than accepting it? You know, in the, in the words of Sean Stevenson, how can I make sure this was done for me and not to me? And let me give you a quick example because this boggled me backwards three days ago. BBC, that media company in, in the UK, reported that during the two years of COVID, there were over five, get this, million new first-time millionaires registered during those two years of COVID. Over five million people turned around and went, all right, I can't go out. I can't go down to the bar. I can't do this. How can I focus on me? How can I focus on my business? How can I focus on my life? And then focusing on COVID as a benefit for me. I speak and train and coach all over the planet, okay? My wife said to me when COVID started, and we were in about three months, she said to me, do you know this is the first time you haven't been on a plane in a four-week period? It didn't matter if it was Arizona. It didn't matter if it was Istanbul, Israel, Hong Kong. I am, I am a gold and platinum member of every bloody airline you can think of because I'm constantly traveling. But during COVID, I had all that time. Right. Honestly, a month was like three months to me. And I started working on my business. I started working on Sims Media. I started working on my podcast. I started working on my health, my fitness. Everything I started working on created impact. It's the best two financial years I have ever, ever had. But I haven't been out to, able to go out. And five million other people did the same thing. So for me, I believe you've just got to, first of all, have the mindset, is this an opportunity or is this a negative? And here's the thing. Whatever you decide, it will be. It's the classic, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Right. And that's how it is. <clears throat> you had this other quote you said uh, in your book. You said nobody ever drowned by, uh, you know, fall, or, uh, falling into a uh, water. Right? Falling in the water, they... yeah. My dad, I don't know how my dad came out with that because he was a very inappropriate, thick-headed Irish bricklayer. Yeah. And there was nothing profound and deep about him in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and this is coming from me. And one day he just put his hand on my shoulder and he went, son, always remember, always remember this. And I went, what's that? And he didn't even look at me. He just had his hand on my shoulder as we were walking down the street. He went, no one ever drowned by falling in the water. They drowned by staying there. Yeah. And he took his, yeah, he took yeah. his hands off my shoulders and carried on walking. I'm thinking, where the fuck did that come from? You know, I had no idea. And I was stunned, <laughs> but it was years later that I suddenly realized as entrepreneurs, and I'm sure you're the same, we've all failed. We've all yeah. fallen over. We've all got kicked in the sack. It happens, but it's how you deal with it is everything. Well, there, there's so many ways that I think people have heard something said that has uh, profoundly impacted their life. For me, it was um, while I was in, in the military, my drill sergeant had said, uh, if you're going to go through a minefield, follow somebody, right? Tony Robbins says, model what works. It's like, okay, those two things are pretty much the same. You know, there's yeah. so many different 
um, little tidbits that we pull out of our life experiences and then we interpret it. And it's like these same um, principles work no matter what. So um, what's some of the little principles that you've taken from your days of being able to make the extraordinary happen? And if you can just share with our, our audience one crazy, you never thought you'd pull it off story of extraordinary. That's actually a deeper question than you realize. Again, if it's this, uh, if you can or you can't, you're right kind of thing. If you look at something as, oh my God, I'll never be able to pull this off, but hey ho, I'll try, you've already registered yourself to failure. So with me, my superpower is ignorance and stupidity. I don't recognize I can't do anything. You know, I'm just going to go and do it. And if it works, great. If it didn't work, I'm educated on why it didn't work. So I had a client of mine uh, when I was in uh, Rome, and he contacted me because he knew I was in Italy at the time, and he wanted to have a dining experience in Florence. Um, and this is probably one of the ones from the book that, that you'll remember. And he said to me, I want to create this experience. I've got my fiance coming over and her mother and father, so I want to impress them and show them how connected, connected and powerful I am. Sure, let me see what I can do. So I always go for stupid, and that's a shallow plug, because in October this year, my next book, Go For Stupid, gets released. Um, so, you know, be on the way out for that. But I've always in the office gone, hey, go for stupid. What's the most ridiculous thing that could happen here? You know, if you want to make $5 million, go for 15 and fail and make 10. You know, so I've always thought, what's the most ridiculous, stupid thing I could do? If you're going to have a meal in Paris, where does it need to be that is quintessentially Parisian? Eiffel Tower, Arc de la Triomphe, something like that, okay? Yeah. If you're in England, <clears throat> where's it got to be? I don't know, Buckingham Palace? You know, some, again, Parliament? Something that, again, can only be in England. You know, if I showed you a picture of me having a picnic outside the uh, um, Statue of Liberty, you'd know I was in New York. So I thought, what is only in Florence? Now, there's loads of other cathedrals and artwork and stuff like that all over the world. But there's a museum, and in that museum houses a statue, and it's the most iconic statue in the world, more famous than the Statue of Liberty, and that's Michelangelo's David. So I thought to myself, where's the most ridiculous place to have a meal? I know, at the feet of Michelangelo's David at midnight. You know, that's ridiculous. And I went for it. Now, there's a whole system on how I did it within the book. So if you want the system, you can get that. But I, I went for it. And that's the key. I went for it. I spoke to people. I communicated with people, tried to find how I did. And they said, yes. Now, here's the thing. I didn't have a plan B. I wasn't finished with plan A. And plan A was to get me a dining experience at the feet of David. And I got it. And I'll be honest with you. When I came out of it, I was astounded that I got it. But then once I got it, like all entrepreneurs, we hit that success and we go, great, I'm successful. I pulled it off. Now what? What can I do next? And nine times out of 10, that's when we screw it up. But I managed, I'd got the, the, um, the chef, I'd got all the catering, I'd got everything ready. The next thing I pulled off was I thought, well, you're in a museum, you're having a meal, it's deadly quiet in there. I need some entertainment. What's the stupidest, most ridiculous entertainer I could get in Italy? I ended up getting Andrea Bocelli to come and serenade him while he was eating his pasta. Okay, so that's what that's the kind of level that I play at. Now, I know this sounds strange, but I don't care. I don't care about going to award shows. I don't care about walking down red carpets. I don't care about being backstage at concerts. I'm not that guy. I'm actually an introvert, and I'm not warm and fuzzy. You can probably vouch for that by now. I don't want to do those things. But I do want to engage with successful people and learn. I want to know why you're successful. I've had conversations with Elon Musk, Jean-Paul DeJoria. I've had some phenomenal conversations with people to learn how they do it. One of the biggest things I discovered, and it was synonymous with all of them, 
it was funny. It was a common trait and a common conversation from, from Korea to, to Los Angeles. Really successful people value time differently than non-successful people. How many people do you know when COVID came up would jump on Facebook and go, hey, yeah. what shall I binge yeah. watch on Netflix? Do you remember that? You know? <laughs> God rest you. The, the people that have idiots, watched Game of Thrones you know? seasons but, one through whatever for the nth time. <laughs> yeah. Sat on that fat ass and done that. And that's what... But you see, the funny thing is when you speak to a successful person, they know sure. they can make more more money. They know that. Right. They know they can make more impact. But they also know they can't make more time. So when you speak to an affluent person, a successful person, I'm not on about Jimmy that's got a BMW and just bought a Rolex on his credit card. I'm on about a successful entrepreneur. When you speak to them, it's literally like being grilled. You know, I'll say, hey, how you doing, Josh? And you'll be like, hey, Steve, yeah, I saw you working. on. How are you doing with that? Oh, well, I'm actually working. Well, why are you doing it? Why do you think you're the person that can pull that off? How can I help you? What impact are you trying to create? So what's the ETA on this being complete? Right. It's like you expect a spotlight to come out. Because they want to, you, they want to use every moment they've got to create the maximum impact. They don't kick back with a beer. Literally, they don't. They'll be sitting there, maybe with an old fashioned in their house, right. contemplating their next move or their next five moves. It's like a chess move, but they view time differently. And those five million millionaires, they viewed COVID as a gift. They didn't lose any time in the car. They didn't lose any time. You could have 20 meetings in a day. You think about traffic right. now, especially LA, New York, London. If you've got to go across town to have a meeting, you're doing one meeting in a day. During COVID, you could do five like me, and not right? even be wearing underwear. So <laughs> COVID had some phenomenal. There you go, Josh. Thanks for that. You proved it earlier. But you know, we had so many opportunities, so many dipshits out there right. wasted, and you're not going to get that back. But those people that are kind of, oh, I want to get out that, get out there again and get my two years back. Screw you! You could have been doing something with that. You're right. the lad asked to decide. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's um, it is a remarkable thing when you think about people who um, constricted their marketing, constricted their growth over that last two years because they were like, oh, there's nothing to do. And then you have other people that they said, I, I, I'm going to just pivot. And they're, you know, doubling down, tripling down. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I never thought I would have been starting a podcast, um, but it was throughout that time period that, that somebody kept kicking me in the ass saying, hey, look, man, you got to change what you're doing. And so, um, so we've been changing Changing a lot of things around here. Um, man, I, uh, <laughs> there's, there's just, there's so many really interesting ways that you've done some of your conversations with people. Um, there's an example in your book where you talk about, um, uh, certain, certain guy that, um, is, is supposed to, like, he's supposed to go do something that's going to make his, his buddies, um, think more of him. And, and, uh, oh, so, so he's mansion. supposed to go to the Playboy Mansion. You kept, you know, the, this is such a cool book. If you haven't read it, Blue Fishing, really good stuff. But there's a story. The guy is basically saying he wants to go to the, the, the Playboy Mansion. And you're like, I don't hear any excitement in his voice. Uh, there's something, what's going on there? And then you said, um, you know, well, after that, what do you want to do? And he's like, well, I'd love to go up to wine country and, you know, whatever. And you basically come to find out, Hey, the guy's, you know, he's playing for the other team. He, you know, <laughs> he, the guy's gay, right? He's not really caring about the playboy man. Yeah. The guy was gay. The guy was gay in a stockbroking, you know, macho world in New York. And he wanted to go to the playboy yeah. mansion to throw him off. And, and so, you know, he didn't want people knowing what you're doing is you're trying to discover what is that thing that, how do I make this person's life better? And I don't care what, whatever people want to do is their own business. How do I make somebody's life better? How do I help them um, achieve a greater level of happiness? And I think that core 
comes through um, through talking to you, through in your book, watching some of your other uh, podcasts and your interviews. You're also on Facebook and Instagram. You're you have a lot of social media stuff, so go check it out. But it comes through where you show that I actually um, like I'm, I'm actually here trying to help. And in in discovering that that why, I mean, and that's the that's my biggest takeaway so far is just asking the why. How do you get to the why? Understanding what is a person's why? What is your why? You know, and then figuring out that and and helping helping people achieve that. So. It's scary. I'll get people that are DM me and they're like, hey, Steve, I'm in L.A. I'd love to take you out for dinner. And I'll just respond with one word. Why? Now, I'm not trying to be a prick, although probably an A class at that. But I really want you to explain to me why I need to be going out for a dinner with you. And I'll get people literally violent, pissed off, going, oh, I heard you were cool. You're arrogant. Oh, screw you. And all this. And then I'll get other people going, Great question. Well, I'm working on this project, and I thought you could help me with it. And then it may be a case of, sounds interesting, I'll be there, or actually, that's not my bag, so let me introduce you to someone else that can help you. But I I ask why a lot of times, and I'm yeah. amazed I mean, why and it still gonna, scares people. It's going to get to their core. I mean, I think it's really it's a great um, uh, appeal back of the onion, so to speak, like, you know. Hey, let's just go another layer deep. Um, Tony Robbins says nobody really wants uh, pieces of paper with deceased notables on it. They want what that money will do for them, right? Um, and it's something I got to kind of think about, too, because, you know, we have to set these goals. And uh, with Tim Bratz, and we talk about legacy a lot and parenting, um, trying to raise good kids. What does that mean? Why? Why do you want to raise good kids? You know, like... It's a tough question. Do you have, um, now, I don't know. Do you have kids? <laughs> I have three, and I like two of them. All right. Keep them guessing. Um... <laughs> yeah, yeah I, that, I always say that. It's a very boring statement for me to say to them, but it does keep them on their toes. As to it, it's interesting because in a lot of the podcast moment. interviews I've done, um, that is a big why for me. And so I always try to bring up how are you – uh, how have you impacted your kids? What's some of the stuff that you've done? Um, there's a old biblical phrase. It says uh, a prophet's never welcome in his hometown. It's kind of like, all right. So if dad says it, sometimes they don't even listen, but then some total stranger is going to say the yeah. exact freaking thing. And it's like, Oh wow. He's so smart. It's like I taught him that, you know? So how are you impacting your children? You know, it's weird. We call it the cool uncle, um, but you're right. I'll actually, I'll try and teach my kids something in marketing or media or branding, and they'll be like, oh, dad, whoa, you're just dad. What do you know? And one of my students, someone that pays me to train them, will end up at an event and meet my kids and suddenly start talking to them about marketing and they will come to me going, oh, my God, you know, that guy's so smart. He was saying that this is, I'm going to do that. And I'm like, I try to tell you, I taught him what he's now telling you. And now you're deciding to listen. But you're right. Kids are never think you're cool. I, had a, I, I knew Gary Oldman for a while. And, um, you know, Gary Oldman is probably one of the most famous actors around the planet, been around for absolutely ever. And he said, your kids never think you're cool. He said, it really doesn't matter. Bring in another movie star that's done a third of the movies you've done on far less money, and that person's a celebrity. You know, bring in someone from, you know, Big Brother or Dancing with the Stars, and it's like, whoa, you know, you're famous, but you. So nah, do you take them out to some cool. of these different events? Do you ever? Uh... All the time. You see, I believe kids are, kids are like sponges, um, and you won't. They won't know what they're capable of until they're squeezed. And so when I do events, like I throw these events called speakeasies, which is my idea of a mastermind. The next one's in Los Angeles in October. And my kids work at them. I, I make them, you know, they do the coffees, they get the foods, they hand out the, uh, the I won't give too much away of what we do, but they are very integral in this event. And they have been for like four years. Now, Henry started helping me. And now he co-founded Sims Media. Right. So he's gone from learning this stuff 
to now running a very, very successful brand in a media agency. Um, and thankfully, he allows me to play in it. My youngest one is just hustling like crazy because now he's getting to mingle and have conversations with some very powerful, important people. So I think the trick is don't look for the instant response. And also don't look for the gratifications because kids are shits and they're not going to give it to you. You know, you're going to give your child a piece of absolute diamond nugget and they're going to like, yeah. And then one day something's going to happen in their life and they're going to go, hang on a minute. I, all I need to do is this. Now they may at that time when you're six feet under go, thanks yeah. dad, but don't wait for it. Just understand that your duty is to fill them up with as much information. I, I realized years ago, being a, being a parent, that's a thankless job. You get shit on. And the only time they really want to talk to you is when they need money. But if you can absolutely feed them like crazy with information, people, connections, some of the people my, my son's having chats with now because I've introduced them. Now, I'm never expecting him to say thank you. And I know the people he's talking to, he's only right. talking to because I introduced him, but I can introduce him. I can't create a relationship. Right. That's his job. And thankfully, the stuff I've taught him, he's now doing it. Now, whether or not he forgets I was any part of that relationship, let's be blunt. Who cares? Yeah. As long well, as that's, he's I mean, good, that's the that's way to has. leave part of that legacy. Um, so I got some quick fire questions for you. Um, number one, I mean, maybe not number one, but you could give me your top three if you want. Uh, but some of the most educational, influential things you've done, books you've read, courses, you name it. Wow. Influential things I've done, courses or books. So I'll make this quick. The most influential and impactful thing was Peter Diamandis, the founder of the X-Prize system. He stopped watching the news in the morning. You spend two hours watching doom and gloom, and then you've now got to reset to get into your day of optimism. Don't watch the morning news. Do not start off with that um, that disability. So that was very powerful to me. A good friend of mine, Jay Abraham, anything he writes, read. The guy really knows about connections and uh, people equity and people power. So Jay Abraham is brilliant. But I would say today at the moment, probably one of the most powerful books that was written by Ryan Holiday years ago, but it's actually more current now yeah. is trust me, I'm lying. And it talks about the, the, the world of media. My God, that's more relevant today than it was when he wrote the damn thing. So I would yeah, say trust that me those, I'm lying. those uh, are confessions of a really media like. manipulator. That's a really good book. He also wrote a book called growth hacker, um, Insane. which uh, was also really good. Yeah. It's, it's probably a lot more relevant today to systems and processes. Um, so what, what has been some of the best investments you've ever made? Oh, uh, me. Um, I actually used to work 20, 28 hours a day thinking that's what you're supposed to do because then it will turn the tide right. and you'll all be good. You can't do that. So I start investing in you know me going out for dinner. I'll take my wife out. I'll take the kids out. I'll go on my own. But I will always maintain that I'm enjoying my moment for reward of what I've done. Um, I love riding motorcycles on racetracks. It's my way to meditate. So I'm constantly on a racetrack. Now, people would say, hang on a minute. You're racing a $50,000 motorcycle on a race. Shouldn't you be at work? No. What I'm doing is I'm resetting. I'm taking my mind out of the game for a day so that when I go back into it tomorrow, the priorities will line up. So I constantly invest that in myself. That is a very consistent a person. theme of uh, people that we've had on the show. They all say the best investment I've made is in education, in me, in my team, stuff like that. So um, I really do appreciate you taking some time out of yep. your busy day. Um, I know you're probably planning uh, some kind of other amazing experience, so I'm going to let you get back to it. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been just an incredible honor to have you on the show. and. Um, Look forward to seeing you again, hopefully um, uh, in Vegas or at some event. Um, I got to put you in touch with a few other folks I know who um, I think it would be good contacts to have. And uh, thanks again. So Steve Sims, ladies and gentlemen, if you can find him online, uh, do you want to give us some of your websites and ways that people can? 
Oh, I'm very easy. I'm Steve D. Sims everywhere. D for dashing and one M in Sims. So if you like Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, just punch in Steve D. Sims. But if you want to visit my website and subscribe, then you're going to get told when my new book comes out, Go for Stupid. But in the meantime, you can catch up by buying Bluefishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. And again, that's on Steve D. Sims. Thanks again for tuning in. And we are out of here.